rejoice, rejoice, for this is the day the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. The word says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. For this is a great day to be alive, and we welcome you to our 9 o'clock live worship service here on YouTube and Facebook. What a joy it is to greet you on this Sabbath.
God for this opportunity to worship this morning. Please join me in a word of prayer as we prepare our hearts and minds to hear the word of the Lord. Holy and magnificent God, we thank you for this day and this moment to hear your word, to be in your presence, to feel your anointing in our homes, in the spaces where we are right now. It is an honor and a high responsibility, O oh God, to proclaim your word. Use me, O oh God, as you see fit. Speak through me to your people that we may know that you reign in this world regardless of what our situation looks like, you are still in control. And you are making pathways in the desert, O oh God, and let us know that streams are being made in the dry land. O oh God, speak to us by the power of your Holy Spirit so that lives are changed and hearts are renewed and minds are caused to rest in you. Give me the words to say and I will speak them. Guide my thoughts, O God, and lead me into your everlasting truth. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Brothers and sisters, our scripture reading this morning comes from the third chapter of Acts. It's verses 1 through 10. It is the New International Version. Let us now hear the word of the Lord. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at three in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold, I do not have, but what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up. And instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Seeing Jenkins members and friends, persons all around the world, this morning I would like to preach and teach with this sermon title in mind, Help My People Walk. Maybe you turn to someone sitting next to you or even type it in the chat. Just type in there or say, help my people walk. Over the last couple of months, our lives have been changed drastically by the state of our country. Everyone is impacted by the pandemic, the stay at home orders, the rise in coronavirus cases, the loss of jobs, sickness, non-COVID related or death of loved ones. And we cannot overlook the myriad of additional concerns that many of us brought into this pandemic. Pre-pandemic, people were already dealing with unemployment, sickness, lack of adequate health care or health insurance, poverty, unjust education systems, and police brutality. But when we all heard of the senseless murder of George Floyd and the killing of Ahmaud Aubrey and Breonna Taylor, the pain added to the deep sadness and anger that many already felt in the lives of black and brown people. To see yet another man being stripped of his humanity, another woman being devalued for her worth and both maliciously killed by officers. These tragedies pierced the hearts of many in this world. And I believe I can say with confidence that America is outraged. As the video went viral of George Floyd, rage and pain penetrated many hearts. And if you are like me, you cried out to the Lord, how long, O oh Lord? 
How long will black and brown people have to endure the senseless killing of your beloved image? How long, O oh Lord, will black and brown people be seen as animals instead of your beloved children? How long, O oh Lord, will black and brown people live in a country where we fear for our lives wherever we go? How long, O oh Lord, will we have to endure the knee of racism and oppression in America? Oh, we cry out, how long, O oh Lord? And this is the cry that fuels the Black Lives Matter movement and revolution to fight for reform of oppressive systems that literally strangle black and brown lives. We are calling for eradication of white supremacy, degradation of black lives, and justice reform, eradication of racism, poverty, and police brutality. We are asking for equity in all arenas, respect everywhere, better health care systems, and police reform. These are not new issues on the table for us to advocate for, but we have been fighting for equality for many, many years, and I would say centuries. The man sitting at the gate called beautiful knows a little something about discrimination, marginalization, and poverty. You see, since birth, it is in the text and theologians say that he lived in this state of poverty for over 40 years, begging, literally caused to beg to survive. Poverty is suffocating as he lives in an unjust, unjust economy that discriminates against him because of his disability and literally locks him into a state of begging to survive. The system has failed this man, brothers and sisters. And to further compound this story, it is known in antiquity, people who are disabled are seen as despicable creatures and excluded along with the other excluded groups of persons that are deaf, lepers, deceased, and poor. This man was seen as a social and religious outcast, unclean, and unfit in Israelite society. He was one whose back was against the wall. This is a term that is coined by Howard Thurman to describe people that are disinherited, disadvantaged, and oppressed group. Since birth, this man has been strangled by discrimination. Social structures that bear weight down upon him and consistently lived under the weight of oppression. You know, black and brown people know something about oppression. Since birth in America, black and brown people have been unjustly discriminated against because of the color of our skin. And maybe it's because of the size of our hips or our lips or our thighs or the fact that God made us beautiful black women and strong and fierce black men. Since birth, we have been embedded in an unjust America with an undercurrent or vibe that black is bad and therefore a threat. Since birth, black women have had to fight for equality, fight for equitable prenatal care, affordable health care, and insurance. Since birth, we have disproportionately felt the wealth gap for black people and experienced higher rates of poverty and those effects that come from poverty. Since birth, living in poverty leaves black men and women amenable to an array of health risks and injustices overall. And since birth, we have fought for equality for an education for our black children. And then there is the prison pipeline that is huge disparity and that is plaguing the black community. The Children's Defense Fund founder and president Marion Wright Elderman says in her article entitled The Cradle to Prison Pipeline, America's New Apartheid, she says black children are more than three times as likely as white children to be poor and are four times as likely to live in extreme poverty. A poor black boy born in 2001 has a one in three chance of going to prison 
in his lifetime and is almost six times as likely as a white boy to be incarcerated for a drug offense. And then in an article by the CDC, the cradle to prison pipeline is compared to or is called a pandemic affecting black children. These are the injustices black people face. The man sitting at the gate called beautiful easily could have been named Rashard Brooks, George Floyd, Ahmaud Aubrey, Bre Elijah McClain, and Trayvon Martin. And say the names of the many men and women who find themselves considered an outcast, stripped of their humanity, impoverished and seeking equity while living under the weight of a system that has failed them and left them begging to survive. Brothers and sisters, many times I see people on the streets of Charlotte. Many ask for money, food, and some just say, give us anything that you can give. I see the person, but then I ask the question, why do people have to beg for their basic needs for food, for clean water, for clothing on their backs, for shelter? When Charlotte is one of the wealthiest cities in North Carolina, I believe the Matthew Fent 25 initiative tells us whatever we do for the least of these, uh, we done unto God. And I know that God is calling us and mobilizing us to feed those who are hungry, to clothe those who need clothing, to go to the prisons and to be with those who are in prisons. And not only be there, but to set the captives free. Yes, Mecklenburg County is one of the wealthiest counties in North Carolina. And the disparities are great because Charlotte is one of the 50 largest cities in North Carolina, but our poverty rate is 11.7%. And homelessness has increased and we continue to strive forward, but we need to build more affordable housing. And we have much work to do because we are ranked lowest out of the 50 largest cities in the Harvard study with upward mobility. So if you come into Charlotte and you're living in poverty, then you will remain in poverty. And I believe that God is calling us to make a change to that statistic. These inequities shine a light to a factored system that is in need for repair. We must ask, our scale, ask ourselves by getting acquainted with the men and the women in the mirror as we look at the mirror ourselves. What have we done to perpetuate, to be complicit in? Or what have we done to work for changing the culture and systems that are strangling marginalized groups? As disciples of Christ, I submit to you, my siblings, that there is no coincidence that this miracle is the first miracle recorded in the sacred text at the birth of the new covenant church ignited by the Holy Spirit. Say Holy Spirit. In Jesus' address in the synagogue of Nazareth, he says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because the Spirit has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor and it sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus has set the pattern for us to follow. Now God is calling us to move and follow the will of God. This miracle shows the apostles will to follow Jesus by being obedient to do what Jesus had commanded following the pattern of Jesus. And then we realize that greater works they shall do in Jesus name. And I believe children of God, this scripture gives us our marching orders 
to go and do likewise. Uh, the cornerstone of the Christian church and movement of liber liberation began with Jesus, uh, and it continues uh, through everybody who follows uh, and is an ambassador of Christ. Uh, but you don't go by yourself. The Holy Spirit uh, empowers you uh, to go into those spa spaces uh, and bring about change. Uh, we are called to dismantle oppressive systems Systems, uh, work for liberation of marginalized groups uh, and establish people back into their rightful place of worth and value. Oh, my brothers and sisters, this text this morning leads us to understand how we do this work. You see, when Peter and John went to the temple that day as an act of worship to God, there were two institutional mindsets that were in that space. The first is the institutional mindset of the temple system, or it was a self-righteous mindset. And then secondly, it is a mindset of the movement or revelation by revolution, excuse me, by the Holy Spirit. Let me explain a little bit more what I'm talking about. You see, Luke, who is identified as the author of Acts and the Gospel of Luke, describes his interpretation of these two mindsets. In the Gospel of Luke, the temple system or the temple mindset is depicted as one that exploits the poor and is a deceptive center of prayer and channel of God's mercy. Then there are three instances in this gospel where corruption happens in the temple or by leaders. The money changers are robbing the poor who come to the temple to buy sacrifices. Temple elites are cheating the poor. The parable of the Pharisee and tax collector shows rebuke of self-righteous prayers and economic action on the side of the Pharisees. So for the Lukean standpoint, the temple economy takes from the poor more than giving to the poor and prayers are ceremonies that are more about being seen than genuine acts of fellowship and worship with God. In other words, prayer was out of habits or self-righteousness and not out of relationship or desire to commune with God. Oh my God. The idea of, pi of piety or being noticed for doing good, it fueled the motivation for acts of ministry or generosity to poor people when they see or uh, someone who is less than them and someone whom they look down on with pity and sympathy is what they did to the poor. It was out of requirement. It was out of being seen as doing something good that they gave. But then in contrast, the movement or revolution of Jesus prompted followers of Christ to go to the temple three times a day as a pure act of worship with no preconceived need to go for a show for entertainment or to fulfill a requirement. There was nothing to prove. All they wanted to do is to go and be in the presence of an almighty God. And I just wonder if there is anyone out there today that you you can say, uh, I couldn't wait to gather virtually in my home or in my car or wherever you are this morning uh, just to be with my brothers and sisters uh, and to give praise and glory uh, to an almighty God that brought me into another day, uh, that kept me from danger seen and unseen, uh, a God that allowed me to have food on my table uh, and clothes on my back, uh, and a God that opened doors uh, that no person can shut. They press their way, they press their way to get into a place of worship. And the new church in Jesus Christ, as worship, they worship the Lord. And as identified in chapter two, another requirements of this community was built on teaching, fellowship, breaking bread, prayer, miraculous signs, living in a common place with shared resources in community, giving to any needy person, praising God, and then the power of the Holy Spirit. 
So children of God, what I want you to see in these two mindsets, mindsets as they function in this story, the first mindset is one of selfishness that gives to the poor, is concerned about making themselves look good though in the giving, and doesn't seek to liberate the oppressed by eradicating the systemic poverty, oppression, and discrimination. They can perform acts of service or acts of prayer three times a day and, and give money to this man, but they don't ask the deeper question of why he has to beg in the first place, and nor do they consider what can be done to help. They just become to live into this status quo, that this is just how it is. In the book, Toxic Charity, the author says, when relief does not transition to development in a timely way, compassion becomes toxic. Their giving isn't liberating the other as much as it is fulfilling the need to check off that box and look good in the eyes of their community. But then there is another mindset that is led and empowered by the Holy Spirit. This mindset is selfless. Peter and John seek to see the man at the gate, the poor, the disenfranchised, the disinherited and oppressed. They see the injustice and seek to liberate him by not only giving to his immediate need, but working to reverse the system that is seek to trap this man in a low and subordinate state begging daily to survive. I hope you see the difference in what I'm talking about. The first mindset, it is selfish, but the second is selfless, and it works to move about a, a revolution to change the marginalized systems. The first is easier mindset is navigated through, and, and you know, it's, it's, it's convenient. But the other is, is not convenient. You must deny yourself, take up your agenda, see the person, hear their story, learn the system, navigate change in the system, and fight for what is needed to restore and set people free. The man was sitting in a low place for 40 years because the system failed him. And we know that the systems are people. People make up the systems. Disciples of Christ, black and brown and white, we are called to see the oppression happening in our cities, neighborhoods, schools, jobs, churches, and around the world. We are called to mobilize and work to set the captives free by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the gift of his work is that God chooses to work through humanity. I want to say that again because I really wanted to sink into your spirit. God chooses to use you. God chooses to use you to start a revolution so that other people can be seen and valued as beloved children of God of all colors, of all races, of all sexual orientations, of all shapes and sizes. The beauty of the body of Christ is that we are joined together in our diversity. And when we come together, there is power by the Holy Spirit. And I just believe that God is calling us to rise up and do the work that is called for us in Jesus' name. God chooses to work through his beloved image to bring about liberation of the captives and dismantling of these systems. God's will is for this to manifest in our world. And when the image of God is destroyed by gun violence or poverty or racism or lack of clean water or other injustices, God sends us the body of Christ to stand in the gap and lead a revolution to restore creation to its rightful place. Hallelujah. So yes, the day Peter and John were sent, they were walking to the temple that day as an act of worship centered on prayer of Yahweh, but their worship that afternoon turned into liberation of a marginalized man. And in their encounter, Peter didn't only stop and see the man and determine his needs, Peter also repositioned his focus. 
So today you are in worship, but I promise you it's and tomorrow or the next day or maybe later on today, God may call you to see him and see an injustice and reposition the focus of the person as they look up to someone who is willing to help them. Peter says to this man that is sitting in a low place, he says, look at us. And I just think that the head of the man was no longer looking down in a shameful way, but when he looked up into the eyes of a person that actually cared and didn't walk by him in pity, this lifting of the head opened up this man's heart to receive the blessing of the Lord that was on the way. The lifting of the man's head wasn't enough in itself. But what Peter said and did next forever changed the man's life. I tell y'all, brothers and sisters, this was my shouting point. And this is my next point is Peter called on Jesus. Peter said, silver and gold, I don't have, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Oh, I think you missed your shouting point. Have you ever been in a low place and didn't know how you were going to make it out? Your back was against the wall and all odds seemed to be not in your favor. But when you called on the name of Jesus, hallelujah, you called on Jesus and your life was forever changed. I think we need to take a few minutes right here just to give God some praise for coming through for us right on time. Uh, you called on the name of Jesus and God gave you peace in your mind. You called on the name of Jesus and he healed your body. You called on the name of Jesus as you advocated for your child uh, and God uh, made a way. Uh, can we just give God some praise uh, for coming through uh, right on time? Uh, Jesus is a way maker, a heavy load carrier. Jesus will show up when you least expect it and cover you from danger seen and unseen. And if you know that calling on the name of Jesus will change your life, your situation, and your destiny, God will always show up right on time. Peter called on Jesus. As I open up the fullness of this radical proclamation, I promise you that this will make you to keep on shouting. Because you see, Peter doesn't have silver and gold because he has sold all of his property and possessions to give to the needy as a responsibility as a member of the body of Christ. And so in that instance, Peter doesn't have any money on him. And hear me clearly, money wasn't all the man needed to fix this problem anyway. What he needed was a miracle. And how many of you know that the power of our almighty God is able to provide every miracle? God, the Holy Spirit came through and healed and restored and liberated. And the Holy Spirit will break some change and give you peace uh, and keep you uh, in perfect peace. Uh, Peter called on the name of Jesus. And in that moment, the power of the Holy Spirit given to Peter at Pentecost was the source of the man's healing and liberation. You may be asking, what do you mean, preacher? Peter called upon the name of Jesus, the name that above that is above all names. Peter called forth the power that raised Jesus from the dead, the Holy Spirit, and called forth forth the authority in the name of the one uh, who made the lame walk and the blind see uh, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth walk uh, and maybe you will understand it this way uh, Peter declares healing uh, in the name of the poor Jewish man uh, who was born in a stable looked down upon because he was from Nazareth uh, you know Jesus uh, the one who was threatened 
threatened and a subject of Roman power. Jesus, uh, who was crucified at the hands of the religious elite. Uh, Jesus, he called uh, on the name of Jesus. Uh, not only was he calling on the power and authority of Jesus, uh, but he created a bridge uh, between the identity uh, of the suffering uh, and the God uh, that liberates him. Uh, in essence, Peter says to this man, uh, I call Jesus uh, the one who suffered for you uh, and can identify with what you are going through right now uh, and the one uh, who is uh, a powerhouse, prophetic anointed one uh, who overcame all things, uh, who was crucified uh, and on the third day uh, he rose with all power in his hands, uh, the one that sits on the right hand of the Father, that one uh, that intercedes for you, uh, that one uh, that walks with you and talks with you and reminds you uh, that you are his own. Uh, that Jesus, I say in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. Uh, and today God is calling us to rise up from east and west and north and south and use the power and authority that has been given to us uh, by God in our baptism. Uh, Jesus Jesus, 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 uh, we need to call uh, on the name of Jesus. Uh, see the injustice, shift the paradigm, and call on the name of Jesus uh, to do what we cannot do. God wants us to do the work of systemic change. Uh, then Jesus will do what we can't do. This is what Peter did. The scripture says Peter took him by the right hand, helped him up. And instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. <clears throat> then he went with him into the temple courts, walking, jumping, and praising God. When Peter took him by the hand, he broke a cultural stigma for which we considered unclean. Those who are untouchable or unclean, when he touched him, he broke that stigma. In using the right hand, it seems as if there was a positioning or installation of power for Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father. So the radical transformation is in Peter's actions of liberation. Peter does the act of reestablishing power and position for this man into society. When Peter helped him up, he was elevating him to a higher status quo. Then the power and authority of Jesus did what Peter could not do. The power of God straightened his ankles and feet so that this man could walk. The disciples did the work and Jesus provided the anointing and the miracle. Help my people walk is the title because I believe God is calling forth disciples that will do what Peter and John did on this day and help those who are bound by a toxic system in America or around the world, help them to walk. God is calling us to help the 140 million poor people in our country, help them walk. Help the children who are below grade level in reading in Mecklenburg County and around the world. Help them walk. Help those who don't have make a living wage to make enough money to care for their families. Help them walk. Help those who don't have health care, quality health care, or health insurance, including affordable housing. Help them walk. Help the mothers and fathers who can't afford quality child care. Help them walk. Help stop the cradle to prison pipeline and mass incarceration. Help our black and brown people walk. Help end discrimination towards women in the workplace, the church, and in the community. Help us walk. Help stop police brutality for black and brown people. Help us walk. Help provide affordable housing for everyone. Help us walk. Oh, my siblings, God is calling us to we work for justice, to walk humbly in this world. For the Spirit of the Lord is upon you, and it is 
upon we who believe and is calling us forth to continue the work of Jesus, the work that Jesus has begun we who by sharing the good news with the freedom poor, declaring freedom for rest prison, recovery of sight for the blind, and to set we the who believe free. in freedom God chooses to rest. I want to say that again because I want it to get in your spirit. We God who believe to in use freedom you. cannot so I hear rest the Lord saying, until he comes. So may we it be who done believe you in you freedom cannot rest. No, that if you subscribe to our page, you will be informed of all of the ongoings of this congregation at C.N. Jenkins. C.N. Jenkins is a great place to worship, but also to be a part to grow your faith. So if you're desirous of a church home, we invite you to call us, email us, let us know that you want to grow in the Lord. We also invite you to join us each and every Monday through Friday at 7 a.m. for our prayer call and devotion. We're so glad to connect with people around the world during this time of prayer. Bible study has been suspended. We finished for this year, so we'll start off again the second Wednesday after Labor Day. So you'll hear more about that. But our Tuesday night prayer, also our uh, young adult service, excuse me, our youth service that follows this service and our children's service can be found on the web page. We love you, congregation. We love you, world. Do know that God's blessings upon you this day. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May heaven shine upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, we love you. God loves you. Have a wonderful Sabbath day.